morning a reading from Acts chapter 2, verses 36 to 47. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brother, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to the number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and everything in common, selling the possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Lord, we come before you during this time. We ask your blessing on this time of teaching. Open your, the ears of each one of us. Give me the gift of preaching. Let me stand out of the way of this time. In the name of the Lord. Amen. So like I told the kids, the title of my sermon is a question. And that is, who is the church? So I'm going to begin by telling you that there's no story, no opening vignette to capture your attention as I begin this sermon. Right to the point here at the beginning in the opening remarks. Who is the church? Now a lot of us, like I did with the kids, would recite that old nursery rhyme. Here is the church and there is the steeple. Open the doors and see all the people. You know, that definition of church with the steeple and a whole lot of people is a pretty good description of how we visualize church today. To me, in the simplest of definitions, it's a place where Christian people come to worship Jesus. As for the place, the building, there's a whole genre of study called ecclesial ecclesiology. Now, I know that a lot of you don't know that meaning of that word. I just wanted to impress you with my knowledge. <laughs> I can't pronounce it hard as you just figured it out. But ecclesiology is a study of church building and decoration. Too many churches spend time, more time discussing the appearance of the church than they talk about, than they do talking about the reason for the church. What Jesus said in Matthew 23 applies to a whole lot of churches today. Jesus said, Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead man's bones and everything unclean. A whitewashed tomb a building might look good on the outside, but if there's something dead on the inside, the whole place stinks to high heaven. On the other hand, God-honoring worship can make the worst of buildings come alive, alive in the Spirit of the Lord. So let me tell you what church is not. It's not about a pastor who doesn't preach the Word of God. If he needs a fog machine or an organ pounding out a note after every remark that he makes, then you need to wonder, is he preaching about God or something else? 
If the music is pounded in a way that is not worshipful, you need to wonder, is this worship or is this something else? There's a whole lot of things going on inside whitewashed tombs, churches. Preachers who won't say being woke is wrong, that critical race theory in fact is racist, and that sexual aberrations are a sin. It is those preachers who preach not the law, but their own version of the law from the pulpit today that lead so many people astray, away from the truth, the authority of the Bible. And to those false teachers, God gives this warning in Jeremiah. Woe to the shepherds, that would be the pastors. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. And so is the plight of so many churches. And what is the purpose of the church? Jesus teaches people who are the church this in Matthew 5. You are the salt of the earth. And then in the following verse, Jesus says, You are the light of the world. And that's what the church should be for the people, salt and light. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the salt and light for and of the church. Through the church, its people, the light of the world is illuminated. Jesus is made known. Matthew 5 goes on to say, A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Yet today, I wonder how brightly does the church shine out its light? Is the church even relevant in today's society? Jesus says this in Luke 15. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? As the church of America lost its saltiness. If it has, then hear the words of Jesus in Luke 14. It is fit neither for the soil, I get this, nor the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears, hear, let him hear. In the old television show, Ehaw, there was a song the grandpa and others used to sing. And some of you might think my preaching so far fits right in with this tune. The song begins with, and you'll remember it, gloom, despair, and agony on me. Deep, dark depression, excess of misery. So it was for the prophet Jeremiah of old as he delivered the oracles of God to the people of Israel. And so it is today for those teacher, teachers and preachers who stand unwavering for the truth of the Bible, the truth of Jesus Christ. Church is not about coming together to get a spiritual jolt or a spiritual shock. We are here to have our minds renewed, our spirits renewed and refreshed. Ephesians 4 says, to be made in the attitude of your minds and to put on a new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Church reminds us to take off the old self as if it were a coat and put on a new self as if it were a new coat. Of course, we need to do that every single day of the week, every day of our lives not just on Sunday morning in worship. Church is about the substance of worship, not anything else. Way too many churches have abandoned liturgy and hymnody for the feel-good moments, the feel-good emotions, and entertainment. So you ask, what is liturgy in the church? In Acts today we read, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. Liturgy is the teaching of the Word of God, the fellowship of believers coming together to hear, commune, and to pray. Now you're wondering about hymnody. Hymnody is simply the singing of hymns. 
hymns through their verses express a certain clear theological thought pattern in honoring God. Hymns indeed give us a blessed assurance, a blessed assurance that Jesus is mine. Church is about telling new believers that Jesus is Lord. Church is about telling all believers that Jesus is Lord. The gospel, even if told and retold a hundred different times, never gets old. There's forever new revelation that God reveals to our minds. And those moments, those aha moments, refresh our spirit. Here's something I noticed about church in my own personal life. I'm giving you this wisdom for free, so listen up. The better your understanding of God, the higher your understanding of church worship. The more fully your faith has developed, the fuller your worship at church becomes. The title of the sermon, Lest We Forget, is Who is the Church? And though we might think it's the people of the church, I believe the correct answer to who is the church is this. She is the bride of Christ. In Genesis 24, Abraham sends his servant Eliezer to fetch a wife for his son Isaac. It's a long and beautiful story. You need to go home and read it. Genesis 24. With Eliezer, Abraham sends jewels, gold, and precious stones to give as a dowry to Isaac's future wife's family. And the name of Isaac's future wife is Rebecca. Now, Rebecca represents the church, the bride of Christ, the bride of Isaac, in that we are told that she is beautiful, she's a virgin and pure, and she certainly is energetic if you read the story. For a price, Eliezer buys her, redeems her from her family who represents the world. Did not we all belong to the world at one time in our lives? Was it not Christ who paid a price, redeemed us from the land of the lost to the land of the saved? And once saved, the Bible tells us that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise that is the earnest, that means the deposit for our inheritance. Like Eliezer, purchased Rebecca from her family with fine jewels. Christ purchased us with his blood from this world of sin. Eliezer adorned Rebecca with fine jewels, gold. And in Revelation 3, Jesus gives counsel to the church of Laodicea. Buy from me, that would be buy from the Lord, Buy from me gold refined in fire, so you can become rich and white clothes to wear. Christ adorns the church with gold and white linen. The gold about which Jesus speaks is real, is real spiritual treasure. The white clothes represent the righteousness of Christ. Oh, people. The church is to be loved as a bridegroom loves his bride. It is in the church where spiritual treasure lays. It is in the church where your children are taught to walk in paths of righteousness. He read this from Psalm 23. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So let me recap here. Who is the church? The church is the bride of Christ. And we as God's chosen are the bride of Christ as well. As churchgoers, followers of Jesus, we, as I said earlier, are the salt of the earth. Now what does salt of the earth mean? As Jesus used it back in Matthew 5. Salt of the earth metaphor applies to the way believers talk as the way as well as the way they live. Colossians 4 gives us these words of wisdom. 
Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every, every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, but so that you may know how to answer to everyone. Salt adds flavor to our food, and so to hear salt adds grace and meaning to our words and to our actions. We as the church are to be a light to the world, just as Christ proclaimed himself to be the light of the world. And all truth, all godly wisdom indeed comes through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So let's get this old adage out of the way. I don't need to go to church. First of all, the fourth commandment, which you can find in Exodus chapter 20, says this. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day to the Lord your God. We are commanded to keep the Sabbath day holy. Going to church, worshiping God your Creator, is part of that holiness. And then there's this story that I want to share with you. Years ago, I lived closer to the church that we attended, and I walked to church every Sunday morning. And along the way, my neighbor would always be outside working on his lawn or on his house. He'd be doing something. And I'd always ask him, you want to come to church with me today? And here was his standard reply. No, I'm worshiping by just taking care of being outside and taking care of my lawn, being here with the Lord. And then one day, there was a knock on the door. It was our neighbor, and he had tears in his eyes. And the first thing he said was, I have cancer, and I'm going to die. And then he followed up with this, and I'll never forget his words. Tell me about Jesus. I want what you got. Well, my friend, Gary Laughlin, witnesses to you from the grave, from heaven today. And though he died with Christ in his heart, I know one day I will see him again. He missed out on so much during his life. Hebrews 10 teaches us, Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. I am thrilled that Gary knew Jesus at the end of his life. There could have been only one thing better had he known Jesus all of his life. You can go it alone if you choose, but you're only fooling yourself. All believers need the fellowship of other believers. And where do you get that? As Hebrews says, we are to encourage one another. We are to come together in fellowship with one goal in mind, and that is to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't get that at home. You can't get that at the ball diamond. You can't get that on the golf course on Sunday morning. Who is the church? We are called the bride of Christ. That's how very much the Lord Jesus loves each and every one of us. We are the bride of Christ. And we always come together every Sunday and here together to glorify, to praise, Honor the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and to also encourage one another in our daily walk with the Lord. Who is the church? We are the church. We are the bride of Christ. To God, we give glory and honor in this day. Amen. Let's pray.